Uh, Justice Moreno? Yeah, I just had a question for uh, Lisa on uh, the Estes type uh, robberies. Uh, and Lisa, would you, how would you uh, craft a, uh, a definition to codify uh, Estes? Uh, you know, under, under petty theft, would you make it a wobbler? Would you provide a subdivision for aggravated uh, petty theft that involves uh, force or fear and giving the judge the option of making it a, or the, or the prosecutor, a, a, a wobbler? Uh, or would you advocate something like a mandatory minimum if it's an aggravated petty theft, still keeping it a misdemeanor? Which I think most, most judges do anyway. There's a, there's a big difference between an ordinary, you know, uh, 484 and one where there's some force or fear uh, involved, even if it's charges just as a 484. I think judges would impose more time, certainly within the available sentence of one year. But in, in, in practice, how have judges responded to Estes type situations and still keeping it a petty theft in an aggravated uh, context, or do they stick with it as a, as a felony and a, as a robbery? And before you respond, uh, just real quick, just so we have understanding of the, the enhancement that we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, shoplifting is a mandatory misdemeanor in yeah. California, right? right? So you go from a misdemeanor to you brush by a security guard and yeah, you no, get I know. a, I know. but it becomes a violent, cr a robbery, a violent crime and a strike. And right. It really goes from, it ramps, quite quickly up. So anyway, I am curious to hear what your response is. So I would say, and I can only speak to LA County, um, but if there is a petty theft where force or fear is used, the district attorney files a felony, well, files a robbery, period. So the judge is sort of taken out of the picture. Uh, he can choose to grant probation or he can choose to give the low term or mid term or high term. Right. But the judge has no discretion. And you know, and I and, and um I don't know you personally, but I'm gonna say a lot of the judges, if they had the discretion, if the DA was asking that it be a robbery, the judge would go along with the DA. There's very few judges, I think, that would um, and I'm not saying there aren't any, but but many of the judges would listen to the district attorney's argument. So I think what you have to do in order to remedy this is to get rid of the fact that it can be filed as a robbery. You wanna create a new charge, yeah. aggravated shoplifting, where the maximum yeah. instead of six months is one year, but it's still uh, a misdemeanor. It is not a strike prior. Yeah. They're not 25% of the time. They can't go to prison. That's something you can consider. The other way to get there would be, as I said, you could have a you could have them charge different, uh, you could have different counts. You could have a uh, shoplifting with a battery. Both yeah, of those are six sense. months. Um, so you could get there that way. And it, again, just so that it's clear, uh, it doesn't have to be that any force is used. It can be words because a robbery is essentially taking property from another through force or fear. So yeah, you don't, sure. have, right. I mean, you know that, I don't know. So. Uh, the, the petty theft could also be that as they're leaving and the security guard comes up behind them, and, I, and listen, this isn't every single one, but we have often the video because a lot of the stores have video. Generally, the person's walking out and some plain clothes security guard comes and grabs them from behind. Granted, they did something wrong, they stole, but often the tussle is because they don't even know who's grabbing, right? They turn around, yeah. they see some guy grabbing them, they, they push them off, or they may say something like, yeah. You know, if, if you come closer, I'm going to punch you or I have a gun or something like that. And so then it becomes fear. And the way you could get around that, if you didn't just have aggravated shoplifting, you could charge um, criminal threats. But to me, that's a little scary to recommend because criminal threats is a wobbler and that's yeah. also a strike. So I, I wouldn't want that. Maybe you could say it could only be charged as a misdemeanor. But I think really you have to just eliminate what's, what came through the court system. And really Estes, the, the case itself was a little more aggravated. The person shoplifted and they were outside the store and they pull a knife and they start swinging it. Right. Even at that point, I would still say it's aggravated shoplifting, but at least in that case that started this full- the use of a weapon there. 
there was a use of a weapon. It kind of, no, it was one year. Really aggravated. Yeah. Right, but you could yeah. do one year use of a weapon instead of all of a sudden it's a robbery. Right. Uh, use of a weapon makes it strike. Anyway, that would be, I would rectify it by getting rid of the Estes completely, where the district attorney's office cannot file it as a felony and either l allow them to file different charges that are all misdemeanors or codify a new aggravated shoplifting where the maximum is maybe a year. Yeah, or, or a mandatory minimum of 90 days or something. Um, right. And then, yeah. but then, and then I have a hard time with mandatory minimums because yeah. oftentimes the shoplifting is food. I mean, and yeah, sometimes it's alcohol, but usually it's an alcoholic <laughs> shoplifting the alcohol. Yeah. So there's so many, yeah. you know, it is so, so disproportionate against people of color, the mentally ill, people on drugs, I mean, you know, people with addiction problems. So right. it's, it's tough for me to advocate for a mandatory minimum. However, I would much rather a 90-day mandatory minimum to a misdemeanor than allowing it to remain a strike prior felony. So mm -hmm. take what I can get. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Pete Espinosa. Here's the thing about Estes robberies that really have become more and more um, annoying to me, and that is that they do are inherently more unfair to people who suffer from serious mental illness than they are to just about everyone else because, and, and I work now in an office where we're trying to divert people with serious mental illnesses from the jail into community-based care. And when an Estes robbery is filed because the person with a serious mental illness reacts irrationally to being stopped by the, even when there are injuries, but they don't have the same capacity to react rationally to being confronted by store personnel, it's just inherently unfair to hold them to the same standard. I haven't, in my mind, gotten my head around what to do about that, but I like the idea of statutorily eliminating the DA's ability to file an Estes robbery um, and then have some sort of aggravated petty theft that keeps the crime as a misdemeanor because, as you've stated, these, these, these petty thefts become um, serious felonies and strikes um, and make it difficult for us to keep people from going to prison and getting them into the care that we provide in Los Angeles County. So thank you. Assembly Member Kamlager. Thank you. I, um, I guess want to say two things. One, I'm going to use this opportunity to pitch um, AB 2550 2542, which is actually on the governor's desk, it's the um, Racial Justice Act I was a co-author, but it does actually speak to the disparity, the gross disparities that we see in sentencing. Um, and I think we need to put as many um, options on the table and use as many tools in our toolbox now to kind of raise, to continue to raise the issue around who are the defendants that generally are put in this bucket and are given these enhancements. Um, but I was sort of struck by what the DA um, was saying around, you know, more money um, for diversion. Um, and I guess, and maybe it's, it's me, but I, you know, discretion is kind of a perverse and it's a powerful thing. And we talk about judicial discretion, but there's also a lot of discretion with the prosecutors. And the fact that we have some really good programs and we have a really good program in LA, you know, our diversionary program that we know is cheaper, it's less expensive to run. We know that the results are, um, you know, more positive. And we also know that DAs more often than not are not offering that up. And so on the one hand, the question is, you know, how do you get DAs to do that more? But on the other hand, there's just an acknowledgement of the lack of faith in those departments. And then the question becomes, how do you sort of remove the options that are on the table for prosecutors since the data shows that they're not using the tools that are at their disposal? So I would love to talk about how can we sort of incentivize DAs to use diversion more often and in fact keep folks from getting strikes. But I think I'd much more want to talk about, you know, how do we actually, I don't want to say penalize, but just sort of take the autonomy, take some of the autonomy that DAs have away from you until we kind of are shifting our focus on how to use the court system in a way that benefits 
all of us, including the defendants, because we, we focus just on the circumstance of what happened in that moment. And we don't take into consideration any of the things that actually propelled that defendant into that moment in the first place. So the real question is, what are the, how do we sort of maybe take more autonomy away from DAs? Because many have shown that they don't know how to handle the diversion menus that are given to them. And it's a very biased question, and I'm sorry. I mean, just as a public defender, I think that's a very astute question because in LA County, we have our district attorney who speaks publicly about how much she's backing mental health diversion. Somehow that does not trickle down to her minions in the courtroom. So she can say everything she wants, and I don't know whether she truly believes in, in the mental health diversion or not, but yet they object to almost every case. I and mean, so, so it's a problem because ultimately we can create as many programs as we want, but if the district attorney is objecting in the courtroom, quite often we lose that objection. You know, they've created all kinds of different courts here. We've got homeless court and mental health court, and, and that's great, and that's, that's wonderful. They did that without giving us any extra money to hire more people, so we're having a difficult time staffing all that. You know, you can, it's nice to talk about it. It's, it doesn't always get implemented. And I think if you don't make laws where it almost has to be implemented, it's not a matter of getting a buy-in. The district attorneys just have to divert if it's X, Y, and Z, then maybe that's the way to get it started. Because while we have people like you, Mr. Rosen, who seem to be progressive and maybe it does funnel down to the people that work for you, I don't think in all counties that's the way it works at all. Well, I, I just would say that uh, look, obviously, I can speak for my county better than, than other counties, and we're diverting tens of thousands of people out of the criminal justice system every year here, and we're about 2 million people in our county as opposed to LA County, I think, is 10 million or more. But, but even the tens of thousands that we're diverting out of the system, Ms. Roth, of course, does the public defender agree with every decision we make in the DA's office? Of course not. That, that's why it's an adversarial system. And of course, the judge doesn't always agree with what the public defender wants or what the DA wants. So we may say we want X sentence and the judge disagrees and gives a lower sentence. Happens all the time. Defense may say we want Y sentence. Sometimes the judge disagrees. It gives a higher sentence. So it's a little bit the nature of the adversarial system. I mean, one thing I would, I would point out, and Governor Brown, you, you had on earlier, certainly has this historical perspective, is while you know, eight or nine years ago, the prisons were bursting at the seams in California and we were under a federal mandate because of the unconstitutional conditions. The prison population is much, much lower in the state today than it was eight or nine years ago. I mean, this panel will know the numbers better than I will, but it's tens and tens of thousands fewer people. And so we are moving in the right direction. And part of what I think the work of the Sentencing Commission, if I might suggest, is for, for many decades, we added all kinds of things to make the, system, the prison's population bigger. You know, higher sentences, fewer parole opportunities, fewer credits, it's more enhancements, et cetera. You can't change that overnight. But what we've been doing the last five to 10 years in the state, I mean, all of us, is collectively beginning the process of de-incarcerating. Prop 36, realignment, Prop 47, Prop 57. You know, these are all things that, that have the effect of reducing the prison and the jail population. And so, you know, I think that there's other things the commission can do, whether it's lowering sentences across the board, whether it's making the maximum double the base term, whatever it is, there are ways to gradually continue this downward escalation. And, and I would just say that, um, you know, as a DA who, whatever, Every elected official gets criticized for all different reasons now. Um, DAs are elected, as are the assembly members elected. And, and we're trying to be as responsive to our community as we can. I don't always agree with what the state legislatures in my county do. They don't always agree with what I do. But, but we do have areas where we agree and we try to work together. And I think that generally speaking, DAs, as well as state legislatures, as well as the public, would like to see fewer people incarcerated, would like to see more rehabilitation and less incarceration. I think that we spend way too much money 
on the back end of the system on prisons, which are incredibly expensive. And if we spent more on the front end, which for assembly member, uh, the assembly member might be drug treatment, mental health, which I agree with, but I think the front end might be more police officers because then you have less crime to begin with. Fewer, so less defendants, fewer defendants, fewer victims, like, and that's cheaper than, than sending people to prison. So I just think as, as, a, as folks that are in the state legislature, if we can try to get more of the money spent on the front end and less on the back end, we will be better off. DA Rosen, uh, I wanted to follow up on something and then I'm gonna also ask a similar question to Professor Weisberg, so you're on deck, Bob. Um, I, I was wondering if you could respond to the discussion about the Estes robberies and the idea of, uh, again, this isn't strictly an enhancement, but a way to find this middle ground of some kind of aggravated shoplifting, if you think that that's an appropriate type of reform. And then uh, to you, Professor Weisberg, if you know of nationally how this particular problem is, is handled and if other states, or if you have other ideas about how, again, to address this, this particular problem. So first to you, DA. So as to Estes robberies, I'm not aware that this is a huge issue in my county, and this is a very specific kind of crime that we're talking about. And it's, I don't know how big of an issue it is in my county or, or statewide. Um, but I, I agree that it is one of those crimes where there is a lot of discretion. Right? And, you know, any kind of robbery can be charged in many different ways, from theft to robbery with different enhancements. And the Estes robbery is something that's subject to um, a, a big discretion as to how it can be charged. So um, my approach, my thought would be, um, if this is such a significant problem, and I, I don't know whether it is or not, but if it is, then I would say, I would look at mending it, not ending it. And, and by that, I mean um, uh, limiting the area of discretion. So if it can now be anything from a misdemeanor to a strike offense, right? then maybe limiting that to you know anything from a misdemeanor to a felony that's not a strike offense you know that would be sort of uh, one approach and i just don't know um, enough about it to give you a definitive answer but i would say that there are many gradations of how that can be charged and rather than saying take it all away like honestly i cringe when i hear oh well the person just stole something and then turned around and started swinging a knife at somebody okay that's like just remember what Governor Brown said, that there's ideas, there's the philosophers, okay? And then there's what real people think. And just FYI, that, that's not gonna fly to treat somebody pulling a knife and waving at someone and just treat that as a misdemeanor like it's another kind of shoplifting, like that, that's not gonna go anywhere. But, but to have some kind of gradation that's maybe not as significant as a strike is something that I would be, um, that I'd be open to discussing. If I can just, just to correct something real quick. So there isn't really discretion per se, because if they use force or fear, it, it's just a robbery. The reason we call it Estes robbery, I think, as you know, is just because that was the name of the case that, that allowed for it. So it's not that a D, I mean, the D is going to look at it and say, but that's the crime that was, that was committed because they used force or fear. And I think what we talked about is most of them, and it's used all the time in LA. I mean, this is a huge problem in Los Angeles County. And I think you're right, when someone uses a weapon, that is maybe something that we have to think about how to deal with that specific type of shoplifting. But when it is just force or fear, and it is just someone leaving, and it's the security guard that grabs them, and it's a little tussle, I think that's the big issue. And, the, and it's no, there is no real discretion. The judge has none, because it's filed as a robbery. And I think the DAs look at it as, well, that's the crime. We're, we're charging the crime that was committed, right? There's no misdemeanor. Uh, they don't, they don't have the discretion to make it one way or the other. So I would just, I just that. So pr Professor, well, first of all, I wanna say that the, the, the question about how big the, any of these problems are is you know, huge on our minds and we're trying to collect the data to really actually try to find it. It's difficult with Estes robberies because it shows up in the data as a robbery and we don't know what it is. And the same thing goes with the enhancements too, which shows up as a robbery, but we don't know if it's an armed robbery or not until we see the enhancement. So it's over-inclusive and under-inclusive. Uh, Professor Weisberg, I have two questions for you now. The first is, do you know, if do you have any imagination either how it's worked nationally or any thoughts on how, about this kind of aggravated shoplifting idea? Um, and the second is, uh, because DA Rosen brought up 
the specter, and we've talked about weapons and gun enhancements in general, um, we all sort of just inherently think, I mean, guns are dangerous, obviously, but again, this is a data question. Do we know that stronger punishments for possessing a gun actually increase public safety? Well, okay, on the first one, it's tough to get information from all the states, but I will say that there's a good old fashioned law school question here uh, around the country as to whether that that is robbery. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Ms. Roth very uh, helpfully described a kind of continuum of types of force that the offender uses. And there are many states in which I can at least safely say that if, in, uh, referring to one of her hypos, if the offender does not initiate the force, if it is reactive on his part and not, and it is violent, his reaction is not violent, it won't be called a robbery. That's because there's a dispute about, you know, whether that actually means robbery. And in some states, it won't be called a robbery, which means I assume there'll be a little discretion in the larceny sentencing, uh, you know, that could take account of that, okay? Uh, related to that, I just want to emphasize, you know, why the strike structure is such a problem, because it's one thing to, uh, to, to allow a small difference on this continuum, based on how either a prosecutor or a judge or a jury looks at it, to add a year to a sentence or something like that. But you, there's a cliff effect here. Oh my God, it moves up one notch and then it in effect moves up many, many notches because it serves as a strike. And that's why the, the prior stuff just interacts so very dangerously with uh, uh, everything uh, else. As for deterrence, well, I don't, it depends on what you're trying to deter. But uh, right down the hall from me, Professor Donahue is the great scholar of the subject that private weapons possession uh, does not reduce crime by virtue of uh, scaring possible offenders into thinking, oh my gosh, the homeowner or whoever is going to use a gun on me. That's been part of a big debate, but I, I, I think there's just no evidence of it. But most important to say, our sentences are so long for so many things, nationally or in California, that the safest thing to say is that we have long passed the point of marginal deterrent effects from criminal, uh, from, from uh, increased sentencing. There could be other grounds for long sentences, incapacitation, retribution, whatever. But it's it, we've reached the point where to say, two more years on top of X more years will achieve the deterrent effect as no scientific basis in terms of marginal deterrence. Thank you. We have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes left in this panel. Does anybody have any more questions? If not, I wanted, we really haven't talked about the gun enhancements. Yeah, go ahead. And I, and, and I'm glad that everyone's interested in the, uh, in the robbery and the SS robbery, because that's a huge, problem in LA County. So I, I'm hopeful that you can take something away and, and, and work through that. But I, I would ask the committee to seriously consider looking at 12022.53, the 1020 life, right. and eliminate it. And if not, I did give some other, um, you know, some other, I guess, um, suggestions. But really, if you eliminated that, still have penal code section 1202.5 you don't even have to in, you know, create another section that allows for punishment if someone uses a gun um, to three four or ten years and so at least the maximum is 10 years and the judge has the ability you know to, to look at the crime of robbery with a gun and maybe the child the, the kid's age or what their record is and and they can get you know, a lower sentence of like five years as opposed to a minimum of 12. Um, the the 1202.3 just really, um, and that is all that's used in LA County. If, if, there, if the underlying crime, which most of those underlying crimes are the type of crime that you're gonna see if, that if a gun is used in robbery, rape, uh, you know, those, those kind of sentence, those kind of crimes, um, you're seeing these really inordinate punitive sentences um, where there's just, there's no discretion by anyone. The DA files it and that's it, you know? And as I said, if there's, if you rob two people um, and you use a gun, you can add the 10 year enhancement on each count. So that's 20 just on that. 
I, as you can see, I didn't advocate getting rid of all gun enhancements. I understand that if you commit a crime and you use a weapon, there's going to be a higher punishment. So I didn't come advocating to get rid of, of gun enhancements, but I am advocating strongly to really look at the 1020 life gun, uh, gun um, enhancement. You know, you look, it was enacted in 1997, right in the middle of where we were just you know, right, raising sentences and, and penalizing and adding as many enhancements in as much time as we could. I think we've all looked back and realized that is not anything that has worked well at all. You know, a lot of the people that I, I've been in Compton most of my 27 years, I'm dealing with 18, 19, 20 year olds. Um, you know, they're, they're not even, they're I mean, we all know about the development of the brain now. So I, I, we didn't talk a lot about gun enhancements. It's tough because yeah, you use a gun and, it, and there's gonna be punishment. I understand that as a public defender, but I would, would ask you to seriously consider eliminating the 1020 life law. I, I think you can, uh, you can punish, it would be an, an equitable punishment. You can get a somewhat lengthy prison sentence and, and allow people to be rehabilitated and get out. That's all I have to say about the gun announcement. Yeah, Rosen, of course, I'm interested in your reaction. So I think that whatever a crime is worth, whatever the legislature says a crime is worth, the prosecution and the defense are going to argue about how much, like what, you know, high, low, you know, and when I say how much a crime is worth, it might be a better way to say how much a certain criminal act is worth. Enha you know, enhancements, crim prior criminal record, whatever it is, the defense and the prosecution will um, debate that, okay? So whether if you raise sentences and made them higher, right, we would debate that. If you lower them, as Ms. Roth suggested, right? Obviously, if you take away 1020 life and you just have the 10-year gun enhancement, I don't expect that Ms. Roth and her colleagues are going to say, oh, we agree that it should be imposed in all of these different cases, right? We're, we're still, they're going to object to that and we're, we're going to, there, there will always be this back and forth. And so I, I just, I just want to remind everyone of that, particularly the legislatures in the sense that that's the nature of our system. We believe that through this adversarial approach, the fuller justice appears. And, and a judge we put in the position to make these decisions. I would say that in general, I think that we've ratcheted up everything over the last you know, 30 years. We started to slowly ratchet things down over the last five to 10 years. And I would say to continue in that way. Now, I think that using a gun is more serious. It makes a crime much more serious. Do I think it's 10, 20 life more serious or 10 years more serious or 15 more years serious? You know, that's where I would kind of like to know a little bit about what, if anything, this does in terms of deterrence. And I, I kind of tend to agree with Professor Weisberg that we've gone beyond the marginal deterrence of adding more time. I think we've, we've already passed that. So I think as long as you are preserving within the system that some things are more serious than other things and, and some kind of enhancements make things worse, but you're generally making everything worth less time, I think that's the right approach. I mean, I would err on the side of looking at, quote, nonviolent things and reducing those sentences. I do think that for violent crimes, including sex crimes, one should take a look at that and perhaps look at, at shaving those off a little bit. But as Governor Brown said, like some of this is, it's not, I wouldn't say it's just emotional. I wouldn't say it's just that. I would say it's what our notion of justice is. So it's not all about whether this is gonna increase or decrease the recidivism rate, okay? As, look, in Europe, in parts of Europe, murder, you can be out in seven years. They, they just, that's their sense. That's not gonna fly here, okay? We have a different sense of what that's worth. Now, and so I just would say, in general, I'm supportive of, of reducing a lot of uh, sentences. I'm supportive of, of increasing parole opportunities uh, as well. And in terms of looking at gun enhancements, as long as it is an enhancement and, is, and increases a sentence, uh, I think that's the right direction to go. Does it have to be 1020 life? Honestly, I don't, I don't know. 
And I would remind all, all of us as well that I agree with Ms. Roth that a lot of these gun crimes are committed by, by young men who are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old and their brains aren't fully developed. I totally get that, that the level of maturity and understanding of consequences, true. But that's why it's even more dangerous for them to have a gun. So you've got to balance that and you also have to speak to people who understand that a teenager holding a gun is incredibly dangerous and probably more dangerous than a 30, a 35, or a 40 year old. So those would be my comments. Assembly member Colin Lager. Yeah, that was a lot there. Um, so, okay, so, well, A, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I mean, I don't think that anyone should be walking around with a gun, but I sort of would actually argue that someone who is younger, it's not that their brain hasn't developed, maybe they've actually just sort of been in the world and have gone through a lot of like challenging circumstances to survive and they might actually have a more sort of intimate understanding of what it takes to live in their circumstance you know and someone who's older probably is wise enough to kind of know the difference but maybe they've sort of been like you know their own legacy and history and judgment and bias has fermented so much that that that's why they're carrying the gun so i maybe i say all of that to say you know that justice is subjective, you know, and at the end of the day, the, the real question is why is it, and I totally get the debate between, you know, defense and prosecutor, but, you know, at the end of the day, the default always does seem to be to go towards the most punitive charge. And it's like, how do we stop that cycle from happening? You know, Estes is really about like turning a petty theft into a strike. And so how loving would love like some suggestions on how to stop the default from happening because inevitably, you know, you see something on the television, you know, the sheriff, you know, a sheriff was shot and then all of a sudden we have to ricochet back to something that's incredibly punitive and then we paint the person out to being a monster. And so how do we move away from that because that doesn't help what this committee is trying to do. Um, to do any of our panelists, that, we, we've run out of time, but just before we end, do any of our panelists have any response to that or, or any quick sum ups of what we've been talking about? For me, this has been a, a really enlightening uh, conversation and actually you know, quite a, a bit of common ground, ultimately, I, I think. Um, does anybody have I would, any last words, yeah, the SDA? Go ahead. I, I do, just, just to answer Assembly Member Comlogger, and I just couldn't tell what your last name was because it cut off on my screen. So, um, Assembly Member Comlogger. It's, it's even longer, it's Comlogger Dove. It's it is like even longer. And, <laughs> it is, and I do want to say, DA, that you know, of the trifecta, you know, judges, public defenders, and DAs, you all, we have empowered you all the most. So maybe I'm like on you because to great power comes great responsibility. So I'm going to try to turn it around into something positive. I, I, I completely agree and understand. I think what I would, would say um, about how do we get, why is the default always charging and seeking the highest sentence or charging the most serious crime? This is actually something that, um, that we recently dealt with in my office um, in light of George Floyd murder and, and really the calls for racial justice. We've changed what our charging manual is in terms of how we approach charging crimes. And we specifically say um, that the question we want our prosecutors to think about is what should we charge? Not what can we charge? Like, like it's a law school exam, like pick out all the different crimes that are here. Not what can we charge? What should we charge? And the same thing in terms of enhancements. Not what can we charge? Yes, it's a prison prior. He was on parole or on bail. Not what, not, not what can we, but what should we? And taking into account um, issues of race and equity in our society. So it, it's a way of, of trying to get our, our prosecutors, my, my prosecutors in my office, to think of it things that way. What should we do? Not what can we, but what should we charge? And, and trying to, to make the prosecutors understand that, by the way, even when you do that, don't think that you'll go to court and the defense attorney is gonna thank you. 
they're still going to say, well, I think it should be lower. You know, I should should be this. Like, but that's that's not the issue for for us in the DA's office. It's what do we think? What should we do? Not what we can. And so that's that's one one significant way because we review 40, 50,000 cases a year in my county. That's that's one way we're trying to get at exactly what you're saying. I don't want the default to be the most serious. I want the default to be what's just in this situation. Sometimes that'll be the high term, but most of the time it won't be. And and let's and that's okay. That's appropriate. Uh, I, I will give uh, Senator Skinner the last word. Thank you, DA. Go ahead. You're on mute. On mute. I want to invite uh, DA Rosen, and you don't have to respond now, but I want to invite you and the DAs to think through the gun thing a little more and to give us some help. Because when I think about the ubiquitousness of guns, I don't own one, but I'm a really, uh, I'm in the minority in America. Okay, I'm in the minority in California. And so if we use, yes, I don't want to ever to be a victim of a crime with someone with a gun. I don't. And yet, when we think about the gun enhancement and we take then this, um, the reality that we know that you're far more likely to be stopped, to be arrested, to be charged if you are non-white. That, that, and yet we know that Caucasians, that whites own guns in at least as large of numbers and also commit crimes in similar manners. Uh, just you take all those things and then <clears throat> we if we're still wedded for example to gun enhancements without parsing through those aspects i i just think we have we have to you know parse through those and i invite you don't need to discuss it further but i really invite the da's to help us think through that kind of those things i i can't i can't emphasize that enough uh, da rosen we, you've talked about the adversarial system in the courtroom. We're trying to not do that here, right? We really want to try to find consensus. And you talk about justice in a lot of ways. I, obviously, that's important. I think public safety is our other, you know, related guide star. Um, and uh, while there's been consensus, at least on this panel and with Governor Brown and with so many people, that we've gone too far, um, we really, it's easy to say that there's a problem. The harder part is finding out what the solutions are. And so often with DA associated, law enforcement associations, we ha I haven't felt that there, there or what, I, what we would, let me put it a different way. We would greatly appreciate the help of, of crafting the solutions. Um, and, and we really appreciate you coming out here and willing to offer and brainstorm with us. I can't thank you enough. Um, so we're gonna, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, har, har, har. Um, we are going to, you know, it, enhance your, your participation here. Your, your, your committee enhancement is... Lock time <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but we're putting you on the spot. Happy, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to continue to engage with Senator Skinner or your commission in a way to um, think about some more. I mean, there's some specific suggestions that I had, but to look at other specific suggestions, including how we deal with uh, uh, with guns. And with your I colleagues, and especially, you know, talking with your colleagues, you can help with talk to your colleagues in ways that sometimes uh, others can't, so that'd be, okay. I, I would just say guns and sex. So why don't we just put it both of them on the table? Because the <laughs> and, and, sex is also a big thing. Right, like a lot simple group. Simple <laughs> possession of a gun should not, that, that sentence shouldn't be raised because a lot of people have yeah, that was something that was mentioned at some point, so. We are going to be in touch with all panelists uh, throughout the course of the year. Our recommendations aren't due until January. We, as I've said from the beginning, we mean to be as transparent and um, collaborative as possible with all stakeholders in the system. I think that there's consensus that there's things that really need to be fixing and we tried, I, I, I'm committed to trying to develop fixes that have real consensus and transparency. That's why we're having these hearings. So thank you all uh, for being here, especially, uh, well, all of you, but I have to give a special shout out to Professor Weisberg, who was one of my mentors. So thank you very much, Bob. Um, we're gonna take another uh, five minute break and let's be back for the, 
conversation about gang enhancements, which we didn't talk about at all, which are another really charged issue for obvious reasons and a big problem. So let's uh, get back here at uh, 316. Uh, thank you all very much. We'll be ready for our next panel then. Thank you. Mike, Michael, can you hear me? No. Oh. Can we get back on? Can you hear me, Mike? I can, Justice Marino, but I'm okay. not sure if we're pu we're public or not. So, oh. do you want to do you want to call me? No, I just uh, just want to let you know I have to get off at four thirty. I've got another Zoom at four forty five. So I, if I, I, am, off. I understand completely. Okay. All right. Hello. Hello. Not sure if we're 
live yet or not. So everybody hang tight. Thanks for, thanks for everybody for being here. We are live, so just let's hold on until Tom uh, relinquishes his screen. There we go. I want to call uh, the committee back to order here. If the members could turn back on their screens, that would be terrific. Uh, Senator Skinner, Assemblymember Kamlanger, and Judge Espinoza, we're waiting for you if you have a chance. Okay. They are probably still indisposed, but I'm going to try to keep the train running on time as best as best we can. Uh, we've covered we've already covered uh, a bunch of ground, and uh, I think we have a lot more to go. Um, this panel, uh, the primary focus of the conversation is about gang enhancements, which um, when we started this committee was really almost at the very top of the list of things that um, folks wanted to us to take a look at. Um, it's a complex issue, um, and we're hearing from a public defender who has studied the legal side of gang enhancements for years, a civil rights attorney who has extensive experience helping people get removed from gang databases, and a prosecutor who runs a gang prosecution uh, unit. Um, so as I've said to the other panelists, we've read your um, your submissions. We very much appreciate them. I'm going to try to keep you guys to five minutes as just to really point us to the highlights of what you want to say and start the conversation. And I, and I think that the best part of the, the most helpful part generally comes from the Q&A session um, where I try to spread questions around as much as possible. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you would introduce yourselves when I when I call on you, I'm going to start with uh, Lisa Romo from the uh, Director of Systemic Issues at the California Office for the State Public Defender. Thank you, Ms. Romo. Thank you. Uh, I am Lisa Romo from the Office of the State Public Defender. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for over 30 years now, and I'm currently Director of Systemic Issues Litigation. I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to uh, join in on this discussion, I think it's well past time that the gang enhancements were subject to some critical evaluation. Gang enhancements were originally created through the passage of the Street Enforcement, you know, Street Terrorism Enforcement and Prevention Act, or STEP, uh, in 1988. And then over the next decade, they were uh, repeatedly amended and um, expanded in both scope and severity, most notably in, uh, by Proposition 21 in 2000. This was a time of historically cry, uh, high crime and gang crime was no exception. Gang homicides reached an all-time high in California in 1994. But like all kinds of crime, gang crime also then fell dramatically. And gang homicides have declined in California by about 70% from their peak. So after being amended several times, the STEP Act now severely impacts sentencing. Currently, section 186.22 imposes a, a two, three, or four year enhancement on an ordinary felony, five years for a serious felony, and 10 years for a violent felony. It also imposes a 15 year minimum parole eligibility for life sentences, and it elevates uh, sen the sentences for some offenses from a determinate term to um, an indeterminate life sentence. To my knowledge, the use and impact of gang enhancements in California has never been empirically studied, but two things have become clear to me. First, the evidence that is used to prove a step enhancement is very prejudicial and it can, pack, can impact the fairness of the trial and, is, um, and can lead to wrongful conviction. Uh, second is that step enhancements are overwhelmingly imposed on people of color. 
So on that first point, I, I would just like to talk a little bit about how, uh, from the defense perspective, these enhancements impact the trial. They basically impact every level of the trial, from bail to uh, plea bargaining, to the guilt determination, and of course to sentencing. They're especially concerning when it comes to the jury determination of whether the defendant is even guilty. This is because to, improve the, uh, to prove the enhancements, the prosecution can introduce evidence of prior crimes committed by the defendant and also and or committed by other people, including people he doesn't, the defendant may not even know, in order to prove what we call predicate offenses. This kind of evidence is, pre is prevented in other contexts precisely because it is so very prejudicial. Also in gang cases, a law enforcement expert testifying as an, exp uh, uh, as an expert usually opines that the defendant is either uh, a gang member or an active participant in the gang, although neither of those things are actually elements of a gang enhancement. This allows the officers to testify about defendant's association, prior associations with uh, other gang members, prior contacts with law enforcement officers, and any other activity that the officer thinks may be gang related, even if it isn't criminal. The empirical studies cited in my statement show that um, this evidence is very prejudicial and can convince jurors to, to uh, convict even if there is reasonable doubt in the case. Another unfairness is the imbalance between the prosecution and defense in gang cases. The prosecution experts have tremendous resources at their disposal. On the other hand, the defendant uh, has a very difficult time getting uh, enough money to, to meaningfully challenge the gang, uh, to investigate and challenge the validity of the prosecution's gang uh, evidence. But even if he did, it can be a dangerous strategy to uh, go after the gang, the accuracy of the gang officer's um, testimony, because it, can, it might only reinforce the stereotypes that so many uh, jurors have about um, the dangerousness of street gangs and gang members. One of the most troubling aspects of gang enhancements is the power of law enforcement officers uh, as, when they testify as experts. They can provide sufficient evidence of every element that is required. Um, for in an enhancement. I, I don't know of any other context where this is true. They routinely testify that uh, a group is a gang or a criminal street gang, that the charge was committed for the benefit of the gang, and that it was committed with specific intent to promote or further the gang. Their opinions are often based on volumes of hearsay, which may not even be available for the defense to review. Um, quickly, I'd like to touch on the dis disparate impact of gang enhancements on people of color, which Chairman Romano mentioned. Um, although social science tells us that gang members uh, um, come in all races and all ethnicities, law enforcement officers are taught that gang members are people of color. This means that communities of color are over-policed and white gang members get a pass. Um, in closing, I just want to say in my statement, I didn't have room to address any possible reforms, and I'm hoping that we'll discuss that in our question and answer session, but also I would be happy to submit uh, additional writing if the committee is interested addressing that well, topic. Thank we'll you. be back in touch. Well, first of all, we'll certainly get to possibles, but we're, you don't get off the hook either. We'll, we'll be back in touch. I do want to go uh, next to Kevin Rooney, who is a supervising district attorney, deputy district attorney for the Violent Criminal Enterprise Unit, which I'm going to assume is gang unit uh, in San Joaquin County. Um, and so I'll recognize you for five minutes, sir. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Still getting used to this. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the committee for having me. Um, as Mr. Romano said, my name is Kevin Rooney. I currently serve as the supervising deputy DA for the Violent Criminal Enterprise Unit, as he said. I know that's a mouthful, but um, it was formerly called our gang unit. Now it comprises, and also part of what we're talking about today, um, is meant to cover you know, groups and group violence that, that aren't gangs, that, that don't um, fit this statutory definition or the real world definition of gangs, but to recognize that there are a lot of uh, dynamics that are at play in both kinds of uh, those kinds of prosecutions. So I joined the office here in Stockton in 2013 after spending my first three years as a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office under Cy Vance Jr. So I have some experience with the New York model that Professor Weisberg 
also one of my mentors, uh, referred to on the last panel. So in my few minutes here, I'd just like to make a brief comment about how we approach the use of the gain enhancement in our unit and in our office, and then talk about some of my primary concerns regarding calls by some to get rid of Penal Code Section 186.22 altogether, and then share a couple of suggestions um, before I turn it over to Sean. So um, first of all, in our unit and in our office, we recognize the seriousness and the severity of the gang enhancement and the additional penalties that it carries when pled and proven. As with similarly significant enhancements like the gun enhancement discussed earlier today, the gang enhancement must be used with caution and proper discretion, and we make doing so a top priority. That being said, however, we also recognize that true gang crime is different in many ways from other types of crimes. Just as there are dynamics at play in domestic violence, elder abuse, and hate crime cases that require recognition in the law, so too are there unique dynamics at play in gang cases that increase the seriousness of the crime itself and the accompanying risks to public safety. There are well-founded reasons why the Judicial Council's bench handbook on managing gang-related cases, for example, discusses topics like protective orders to ensure witnesses' safety and closing the courtroom during examination of witnesses. Where appropriate and where relevant, the gang statute allows for the introduction of evidence to explain some of these unique dynamics to judges and juries. Penal Code Section 186.22 is also critical to the prevention of gang violence. Much of our gun violence in San Joaquin County is gang and group related. Because of the nature of criminal street gangs and the extent to which their criminality is often shielded from law enforcement by a culture of intimidation, retaliation, and secrecy, wiretap operations are a necessary tool to disrupt violent gangs. Without the gang statute, however, many of those investigations would not be possible. Under Penal Code Section 629.52, only investigations into certain enumerated crimes can support a wiretap application. Currently, a felony violation of 186.22 is one of the bases for a wiretap application. What this means is that if 186.22 were repealed in its entirety, for example, a violent gang that both arms itself and supports itself financially through robberies, burglaries, and firearm trafficking would not be a legally viable target for a wiretap investigation. In my opinion, this would severely hamper our efforts to combat violent crime in our community. Of course, there are very valid concerns about the risks of the use and overuse of the gang enhancement, several of which my panelists have outlined in their written materials and we'll talk about today. Um, however, as I laid out in my written submission, I do believe there are also several significant checks on prosecutorial overreach and safeguards against unjust applications of the law. Some of the suggestions related to, to things already said today, uh, one, I, would, I agree with DA Rosen that we should get rid of the ability to charge misdemeanors as felonies under the gang statute. Now, we don't do that, as I said in my written uh, submission, we don't do that here in San Joaquin County, and I don't, I don't think that, there, that there, it should be done at all. Um, also, something that Governor Brown said was, is to trust judges. There, as I laid out, there, there is discretion for the judges to strike the additional punishment and also to strike the enhancement entirely. Um, that's a good thing. That should check against the cases that aren't what we'd call real gang cases. And some of the things that, that Sean wrote about and, and is worried about, um, those, the judges should be able to use their discretion so that people don't suffer those additional punishments where the, it's beyond the spirit of the law. Um, I'd also consider giving them more discretion in terms of the ranges. So just adding simple language like up to 10 years, up to five years um, for the additional punishments on the gang enhancement. Um, I'd also consider, uh, have, have the committee consider obviously, um, limiting the ability of the enhancement to turn a non-strike into a strike. I think that's something that um, would really be worth considering. If you, if you consider that someone could suffer three convictions for being a, a for being for having a possession of, of a firearm as a felon, uh, 
with a gang enhancement and serve a sentence of 25 to life for that. So um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. I hope we can talk about these and other suggestions and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Any friend of Bob's is a friend of mine. So uh, welcome. Uh, Sean Garcia Lees, is that how you pronounce your name? Garcia Lays. Lays, yes. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me to speak. So as quick background, I'm from the Mar Vista neighborhood in Culver City in LA County. I grew up surrounded by a half dozen gangs, but I was never gang involved myself. For most of my career, I worked as a public school teacher, working first in public high schools in South Central and East Los Angeles, and then in a charter school serving gang involved youth. During those years, I always lived in the neighborhoods I taught in. I left teaching 10 years ago and became a public interest lawyer. Though I identify as a civil rights lawyer, my approach isn't based on protecting people's constitutional and civil rights. Rather, it's based on the belief that freedom from violence is the first of all human rights. Uh, I would like to make three points as introductory remarks. The first is to urge this committee to approach this issue with as broad a view of public safety as possible. And what I mean by that is that first, the committee should think of gang prosecutions as only one part of a comprehensive approach to gangs. And so gang law should strive to disincentivize prosecutions and police behaviors that undermine or conflict with gang prevention and intervention approaches. Thinking about the impact on police behavior is especially important because most interactions between law enforcement, gang members, and their communities are based on police encounters in public spaces. And those encounters are in many ways uh, defined by ultimately what will happen according to the penal code. And as the last several months of protests have shown, many communities are still frustrated by the relationship with law enforcement and I believe much of that frustration is driven by law enforcement's overbroad and confrontational approach to gang suppression. Uh, I urge this uh, committee also to keep in mind that state violence, including incarceration, will always have negative effects on a community as well as positive effects. And those negative effects must be considered, especially when the effects are as racially disproportionate as they are with gang prosecutions. My second point is to recognize that there's a gap between the description of gangs found on one side in empirical research and on the other side in the typical law enforcement description of gangs. One need look no farther than the legislative findings start, stated at the beginning of the STEP Act to see what I mean. So if you'll indulge me, there's, there's two sentences I'd like to read from it. Here's the first. The state of California is in a state of crisis, which has been caused by violent street gangs whose members threaten, terrorize, and commit a multitude of crimes against the peaceful citizens of their neighborhoods. The second is that the legislature further finds that an effective means of punishing and deterring the criminal activities of street gangs is through the forfeiture of the profits, proceeds, and instrumentalities acquired, accumulated, or used by street gangs. The first of those sentences isn't entirely false, but it is certainly misleading. Uh, there are some gang members who do all of those things, but street gangs are made up primarily of late adolescent boys looking for ways to cope with a lifetime of neglect, exposure to violence, social marginalization, and who are gang involved only for a short period of time and usually only involved in minor crime. The second sentence, however, profoundly misunderstands street gangs. I've never in my career come across a gang member who would be deterred by the threat of asset forfeiture. For one thing, street gangs are made up nearly entirely of people with no assets to speak of. Usually a bike is the only thing of any value that they have. Any gang members who has an opportunity to make any real money through crime basically has to leave the gang and form a new criminal organization, usually with people they've met through prison networks from other gangs um, in order, otherwise they're, 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 their scheme is gonna fail. Now, I don't mean to suggest by that that gangs don't present a serious threat and that they're not extremely dangerous people in gangs. Rather, what I'm saying is that gang members should not be treated monolithically, and we certainly shouldn't be basing policy or law on fundamental misconceptions about street gangs, like that they can be deterred by asset forfeiture. My final point is that gang, members, gang membership should not be allowed to become a de, de facto status crime. As I described in my written submission, gang prosecutions have evolved in such a way as to make nearly any crime by a gang member prosecutable as a gang crime. Prosecutors do this with the argument that claiming that witnesses, the argument that witnesses are intimidated by gangs, reputation, and any crime committed by a gang member increases the reputation. This is especially problematic when you consider how difficult it is to decide who is and who is not a currently active gang member. Juries and prosecutors alike rely on the opinions of police to know when someone is and isn't a gang member. And frankly, police are terrible at knowing the difference between an active gang member, a former gang member, or someone who is a non-member but is enmeshed in a gang social network by virtue of family and neighborhood. 
That was proved when the Los Angeles gang database was audited in 1992, and the audit found that a full 50% of all young black men in Los Angeles were documented as gang members. It was proved again in the state's 2016 audit of the Cal Gang gang database, and again in LAPD's 2020 audit of its own use of Cal Gang. Now, many prosecuting agencies, uh, as Mr. Rooney has pointed out, have become much better at using their discretion to avoid this kind of overbroad gang prosecution, but many other agencies have continued to prosecute even minor gang crimes very aggressively to the detriment of public safety. I'm mindful that it may be impossible to legislate away prosecutors' poor exercise of discretion by revising the penal code, but I do hope this committee is able to at least narrow the step back to remove the legal foundation for the most abusive exercises of that discretion. Thank you. Wow, that was bang on five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, this is obviously uh, a very important subject and um, touches on so many social issues and criminal justice in a way that maybe some of the other issues that we have talked about today don't quite um, in the same way. What I hope that the rest of this conversation we can try to keep in mind is that again, as I said at the conclusion of the last uh, panel, is trying to find some consensus to try to improve the system. And, and uh, there are many problems with the system, uh, but what we're really trying to focus on, at least for the time being, is the sentence enhancement portion. So I know that there are problems with the gang databases and I, uh, I, I was unaware of the wiretapping wrinkle to this, but Let's try to keep uh, this conversation to the enhancement portion and try to Im improve uh, that, that piece as, as best we can. And I do understand that they're intermingled, but that I think will make um, things most um, productive of the remainder of our time. Um, I, I wanna kick things off. Um, and if, if Ms. Romo, if you could give us a, a brief uh, definition and I'm gonna, ask you to give you a definition that uh, Mr. Rooney would agree with is the statutory definition of what is uh, a gang for the purposes of a gang enhancement. Could you just give us a very quick? Um, yeah, I kind of feel like this is a law school exam as, as you all were talking about. Um, so there has to be an organization that has more than three people that share some kind of name, color, or symbol there has to be the organization has to have a primary activity that is listed in the statute there's a list of 33 um, different uh, offenses and primary activities can be all but i think five of those and then the um, uh, state also has to prove a pattern of criminal activity but that I think the, the word pattern is extremely uh, misleading because basically it means they have to show two predicate offenses. So that means that somebody who is in the gang and the prosecution gets to, uh, gets to define the scope of the gang. It could be a five member clique of kids who are in the same you know, building or it could be all of uh, Sacramento County. Um, that whatever that that gang is, as a prosecutor denominates it, that two people, the two crimes have been committed by people who are considered who are proved to be gang members. Those crimes don't have to be gang related. They could be part of the charges that are being tried against the defendant. They could be one crime if they're committed by two gang, gang members. So those are the elements of a criminal street gang. Without getting into too much detail, uh, Mr. Rooney, do you generally agree with that? Is that a fair definition? Yes, I generally agree. All right. Thank, thank you very much. This is extremely helpful. Uh, do members of the committee, I want to open it up to you guys. Yeah, this is um, Pete Espinosa. I just want to make an observation. We heard, I know there are 58 counties in California, and we've only heard from DAs from two, but it seems that at least between the two, um, they acknowledge that the use of gang enhancements to elevate misdemeanors to, from misdemeanors to felonies is probably not a good idea. And I think we should use the opportunity um, to eliminate the use of gang enhancements to elevate misdemeanors to felonies. I mean, it's, anyways. Just an observation. So go, I didn't, 
to, to be blatantly honest, before we started uh, looking into this, I had no idea that that was even possible. So it goes from misdemeanor to a felony. And what's the maximum punishment of a misdemeanor crime uh, with, a fel with a gang enhancement? Well, a typical misdemeanor is either six months or a year. No, I get that. But what's the enhancement part? Well, no, but it, it, it doesn't add time. It, it elevates the crime from a misdemeanor to a felony. So instead of misdemeanor punishment, you're left with 16, two or three, for example, on, as I recall, on a, on a vandalism. If a gang member is caught spraying um, gang graffiti and um, that act can be used to charge what would otherwise be a misdemeanor as a felony. Is that correct? Am I wrong? That's my understanding. And then once it's charged as a felony, other enhancements can come to, into play. So example, if that defendant has a prior strike, they can have that punishment added to what was, wouldn't happen if it were a misdemeanor. That's correct. And it, actually, they ha it's a distinct triad. It's a one, two, or three. It's, okay. it's different from, but it, it's, it basically makes it into a wobbler, 186.22D actually says any any crime or any offense um i'm sorry it's in the materials but that's what gives gives da's the opportunity to to charge a misdemeanor as, as a felony and as i said we don't do that as a as a matter of course we don't i respect you for that and absent the absent the other enhancement that we were discussing with the priors and whatnot it becomes a one two or three uh triad crime for example vandalism is that correct and Mike, I, I would add, um, I think that part was added by Prop 21, so it would take a similarly uh, big vote in the legislature or initiative to do anything about it, as odd as that may seem, since Prop 21 said it was aimed at uh, violence. Um, doesn't seem like that part of it had that aim, but I just wanted to add that in before we got too deep into it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Other there questions? A question. Uh, yes, Justice how, Moreno. How the courts, the trial courts, reacted to uh, the alleged overuse of gang enhancements. I recall, you know, in the time that I was on the state court, um, you know, cases where the uh, facts supporting the gang enhancements were a bit attenuated. You know, someone shouting out the gang name or three or more people engaging in some kind of activity, but really was it for the benefit of the gang? Uh, I remember another uh, case, I think, that I dissented in. Uh, very attenuated participation by the individual defendant in alleged gang activity, uh, group activity. Uh, I mean, have the courts stricken uh, either before trial or after trial, before going to the jury, these uh, gang enhancements on the basis of just lack of sufficient evidence to support even a jury finding on this? I mean, it, and isn't the Sanchez case about gang expert testimony and, based on hearsay that Justice Corrigan uh, wrote. I mean, are, are, are the courts kind of sensitive to, to this kind of overuse of gang enhancements? Because it seems like it's a very subjective uh, mm -hmm. question. And then my final thing is, are there, are there gang experts testifying <coughs> for the defense? I know one guy down here, Wizar, who testifies for the defense as a former gang member and defense lawyer, <laughs> to even the scales. That's a lot of questions. I, 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 if I may, I'd like to start on the discretion issue, which uh, Mr. Rooney mentioned. So my experience comes, I'm not a trial lawyer, I'm an appellate lawyer, so it comes mm -hmm. from reading the um, appellate reports. And um, we see, every, every day I read several gang opinions, um, and some of them, the gang evidence is incredibly thin. Sometimes it gets reversed. Usually it gets upheld because the sufficiency of the evidence standard is, is very hard to reverse on appeal. But in terms of the discretion, the judge has two kinds. The judge can actually strike the punishment under section subsection G so the enhancement doesn't go away. So there's still lots of repercussions, but the um, they don't have to serve the, um, the actual time, but there are two problems with that. One is that the statute requires unusual circumstances to do that. And mm -hmm. two, it doesn't obviate all the other problems that come with um, uh, filing a gang enhancement, all the unfairness that comes during the trial. When a jury right. hears this so, testimony, mm -hmm. you know, that may not be about the defendant and says, 
geez, this guy hangs out with these people, they're murderers, you know, it's a matter of time. Why would we not send him to prison? Um, and then the other mechanism is 1385, they can actually strike the, um, the whole um, gang enhancement, but that's a very recent phenomenon. Um, until 2016, they could not strike, the judge, trial judges could not strike the gang enhancement under uh, a decisional law. The California Supreme Court changed that in 2016. We don't have any data that tells us how often that occurs. I see it you know, very occasionally in an appellate case. Maybe Mr. Rooney has more information, but I, I would be surprised if it's done on a, a routine basis. I wouldn't say that it's done at, on a routine basis. Um, and I, I guess I'd probably, I'd like to believe that's because we're, we're using our discretion better in the, at the yeah. charging stage. Um, and, I, and as I said, we're also trying to, you know, listen to the appellate courts and what they've said in, in, in decisions over the last 10 years, uh, uh, you know, really circumscribing the circumstances when this gang enhancement should apply. You know, it used to be when I came into the office, it was, you know, people had these convictions for you know, gangster with a gun, which was basically just a status crime. Are you a gangster? Did you have a gun? You know, that's a strike, you're going to prison. Um, we're not charging in a gang enhancement in, in that kind of possession case unless we have facts that are gonna support it. So for example, not to go into the wiretap statute, but I, we have cases where we have wiretapped calls that they're going to shoot up you know, the rival's territory and we stop the car and they have the possession of the guns. We're gonna charge the case case. Like right, right, right. So, like right. so we're, we're, we're gonna charge it there and, and we do feel that it applies. But yeah. uh, we also, I, I have seen and, and heard other, from other counties, judges pushing back at preliminary hearing and saying, this, no. is, this is not, no, not going to pass the semester. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also just to one other point to respond to what Lisa was saying, I do think there are risks at trial. And I think that um, bifurcation can cure a lot of those, not all of them, but can cure a lot of those where you don't have um, that really close connection between uh, the participation in the gang and the crime itself. You know, uh, I, I think that um, that should be used more often. And maybe you know, if there's language that you can you can add to encourage judges to do that more, then you would reduce the risk that someone's going to be convicted in a case they wouldn't otherwise just because of the gang evidence. Uh, I'd like to add a couple. Um, sure. So there are two. Th I do not see, at least in Orange County or San Diego County, uh, where I've done most of my observing, uh, judges um, really challenging the gang evidence. And I think there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is if they look at the legislative intent behind the STEP Act, uh, that is certainly not going to encourage them to be lenient. The, the point is to throw the book at people. And so, uh, so they're, they're, they're well within the law by, by doing that. Uh, thing is, People believe the story that gangs are the worst of the worst, that gang members are the least deserving of sympathy. Um, Lisa pointed out what happens at trial when it does go to trial is uh, evidence that reinforces that belief. Um, I myself have worked a lot with Father Greg Boyle here in Los Angeles and uh, you know, Father Greg says that the reason we need to stand with gang members is because they, along with the homeless, are the most despised and excluded in our society. So there is not a lot of sympathy. Uh, and that extends to the bench as well as society at large. Um, and as for Sanchez, Sanchez does put more burdens on prosecutors to bring more uh, police officers uh, into the courtroom. Um, you know, you can't have one officer repeating the hearsay statements of other officers. Uh, but they can bring those other officers in uh, when needed. Could I just add on Sanchez? I, I think it is definitely a, a welcome opinion. I mean, I really think it was um, a, a very important opinion. But I think the verdict is still out on the impact it's going to have in gang cases. No. Because what Sanchez says is a gang officer can, or a gang expert, 
cannot relate hearsay to the jury. So mm -hmm. he can't tell the jury all of the things that he read in his file that the defendant or somebody else has done, but he can still rely on that information. So he can come in and say, well, I read a lot of police reports and I read um, you know, his uh, school records and I read this and I read that. And my opinion is he's a gang member. And so in some ways that's even worse. Uh, yep. Because how does the defendant challenge that? Um, if you want to start asking the prosecutor, I mean, the expert, how, you know, if you want to start probing that information, you, you're probably waiving your Sanchez issue right there. So the court hasn't sorted through that, that kind of issue. So we don't know actually what the impact of Sanchez is going to be. Right. Well, I would agree that the damage is done when the court reads the charge and the enhancement and then what proceeds with what ire. <laughs> And uh, the cat's out of the bag then. So I think it's hard to, uh, to clean that up, uh, that inherent prejudice in a gang enhancement charge. Assembly member Kamlager, it seemed like you had a question. Well, once again, you know, there's a huge discrepancy between what can happen and what should happen. Um, and I don't really know how, I, there's just a lot more discussion in terms of how to reconcile that. But I have to say, coming from Los Angeles, I'm actually becoming more and more squeamish about the gang enhancements just because, not as it like to suggest that I wasn't before, but with all of the new reports and investigations that are coming out about the falsification of records and sort of how this is used, I, I really don't understand why we would even I, I can't imagine why we would want to double down, not to suggest we are, but there's some real examination that has to happen with gang enhancements in general. Um, I have to believe that if you catch someone doing something bad, and if the only thing you can put on them is that they're in a gang, given the climate we're in now, with how we're learning that law enforcement has sort of used this and weaponized it, why, if you can't find something else with which to charge the person, there's a deeper conversation that has to happen. So I just don't know why we don't sort of look at how to get rid of that in its entirety, because there's just too much credibility is at stake, my friends, with regards to gang enhancements in our database. And could I just say that this isn't a new phenomenon, the Rampart scandal back in the, the late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a gang unit. Um, mm -hmm. And they were making up evidence, they were sticking cases on people, including murders. Um, so it's not like this wasn't a known thing. Okay, so obviously there's, there's misconduct and there's mistakes. And um, I was wondering, Mr. Rooney, how to just in your how do you respond and of course you're just from san joaquin county and that's just one part of a big state but 92 percent of people who have gang enhancements are people of color i mean that just screams out as a problem and i was wondering what your i'm sorry to put you on the spot like this but how, how do you what do you how do you feel about that and um, how do you think we should respond to that? I feel terrible about it. I think it's, um, it's a huge problem for us in our community, um, in our state, in our, in our country, of course. Um, I don't, I mean, obviously if I, had, if I had a solution, I'd probably sell it and I wouldn't be a public servant anymore. But um, I, what I can tell you and, I, and I, I, this, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but what I can tell you is that in our unit, in our office, in our, in our community, and working with law enforcement, but also our partners like um, Mr. Garcia Lay said that in the intervention and prevention is focusing on the violence, right? That we're not just, you know, as I talk to, to young people, it's not, it's not a crime to be a gang member. It's not a crime to, to have friends who are in gangs we're focusing on the violence and the, and the crime that's committed. And, and when we talk to our investigators, you know, we're, we've changed the narrative where it's not, we're not going out with huge nets to catch as many people as we can and, and get the, you know, the, the guy on the corner who's holding the bag. We, you know, we wanna 
find out who's driving violence and focus our efforts there. So I'm, I'm trying to answer your question to say, we had, that's a huge problem that we have to address. We also acknowledge that in our community, those numbers look the same on our victims of violent crime, right? So the, the same, you know, the communities and the moms are asking us, where are you? Why aren't you doing the investigation in this community? Because our kids are getting shot. And so that's where we need to go too. Um, so I think that we have to focus on the violence, but we can't ignore the disparities. And we have to engage with our community about how we, you know, how we change that and how we improve uh, the relationship between law enforcement and the, and the, the rest of the community, including uh, our office. I think it goes without saying that all of us don't uh, want uh, any violence and we're not uh, advocating for uh, elimination of punishment of the underlying violent act, right? The question is, is you know, these enhancements, which we worry, especially being so racially tinged, that it creates uh, the problem. Um, do you think that there's any deterrent effect to the, the gang part of the enhancement? I do, but I also... I also agree with some of the conversation earlier about the, the kind of the marginal benefit when, we, when we're talking about how long sentences, sentences are. And, and, and I applaud a lot of the changes that have come in to, to talk about looking back at some of these really long sentences, to talk about you know, the youthful offender hearings and the elder offender hearings and things like that that are helping blunt some of the impact of these, um, you know, these extreme sentences. Uh, but I have, I have talked to you know a number of gang members who um, they take note. What does it change? Does it change all of their activity? No. Are they going to, you know? Um, so I think there is some deterrent effect, but it, what, how, how much it is really hard to say. Got it, Senator Skinner. Do you have a question? Can I say something right. of ethnicity? Of course. Uh, so I had a section in my written submission that I took out because it was too long. It was specifically about this, but I, I want to, I don't know what to do with this piece of information, but it's the key, which is that for most of America's history, gangs, street gangs were mostly white. Uh, and I think the time that people best understood gangs was when we thought of like greaser gangs versus socias and the outsiders. I actually think that today is still probably the most accurate portrayal of what most gang gangs are like. Um, and when that happened, it was considered juvenile delinquency. And it was treated as something that we expected counselors and schools to handle. And then sometime in beginning in the 70s into the 80s, through a combination of gentrification, uh, income, growing income gap, these different things, white gangs, for the most part, as they had existed, pretty much ceased to exist. Uh, and it was when gangs, street gangs became almost exclusively people of color that is when the law stepped in and said, from now on, we're going to stop treating this like juvenile delinquency and start treating this like the worst of the worst, most serious crime that's out there. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that, um, you know, when we look at the effects, those are the results of increasingly punitive uh, policing and criminal prosecutions that were only possible once street gangs became thought of as people of color. Yeah. Sean, I remember reading a book when I was in college 50 years ago, Street Corner Society. And it was a study of street corner, you know, young men in middle America. And you're right, it was all white. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I just wanna say, I think, um, I, I, I think there are still white gang members out there. I mean, uh, this is, they do uh, studies every so often, one's coming up next year where they survey uh, teenagers and ask them, they go to schools and other places and ask them, have you ever been in a gang? And they actually find that people uh, report a similar level. So all about the seven to 10%. And they actually mm -hmm. report similar levels of committing crimes, yeah. most of them very minor. Um, but they're in different places and they look different and they, and they act different. And you know, one of the things is, does, does it deter crime? You know, as we talk about, as Sean mentioned that a large number of gang members are adolescent. Um, these are people who are not in the, 
making good decisions. <laughs> you know, they're not thinking through consequences um, and they're acting spontaneously. Um, and we all know that adolescents commit crimes together. It's the peer pressure. It's the, you know, being around your friends that get you all excited and, and doing things you shouldn't. So um, I think there are white gangs out there, which is not to say we should be going out and targeting them, but um, uh, you know, I think that um, there, there's definitely a problem with the view that only black and Latino people are gang members. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, uh, Mr. Rooney, I was curious about your experience in New York um, and how it might be treated differently there uh, both policing, prosecution, enhancements. Can you can you educate us a little bit about how it's handled in New York? What they do well, what they do, what we do better. I, I'm just curious about how it's handled there. This sure. Issue. As uh, Professor Weisberg talked a little bit about that, the structure of of incorporating some of the elements that become enhancements in California into the substantive criminal law itself. So, for example, the the robbery to having first degree, second degree, third degree with different levels of punishment. Um, that negates the need for an, an enhancement because it, you know a second degree robbery, for example, would be you know the use of of a firearm, right? So if if you were to carry that over to the to the gang enhancement scenario, it would be you know a robbery committed for the benefit of would be you know an elevated degree or something like that. So you couldn't could change it that way. Um, so I'm sorry, just to interrupt, just to interrupt. Yeah. So uh, ordinary robbery that's committed by a gang in New York goes from whatever, second degree to the higher degree. No, I'm sorry. The, it, it, it's not an element there. I'm saying if you if you try to overlay what we have here into that kind of structure. But so how do they handle gang, gang so, crimes in New York? So I was, you know, I was mostly a baby DA there, but I did work on a, a, a few cases and part of the um, part of the way that they would do it is under their conspiracy laws. So if they could prove a conspiracy to commit a, a you know, a murder, for example, then it would be treated, you know, be a murder. Uh, it would be a murder level um, penalty. Uh, they also have levels of their conspiracy law where it, it, they make it elevated, uh, an elevated degree if you conspire with, some, you're over 18 and you, con and you conspire with someone under 18. They do, you know, those, those adults who are recruiting younger people to get involved in, you know, violent crime there. And so that would apply if, if you if you put that in, in our scenario, that would apply in some of our, in our cases. So that's how they do it. They don't have a separate thing. The other big difference, though, is is the the sentencing ranges that they have. And Professor Weisberg hinted at it a little bit, but there's a lot more discretion for the judges instead of the, the triads. You know, it might be a robbery is, you know, off the top of my head, like two to 15, right? Something like that. And, and then you're gonna look, look for aggravators and mitigators within that. And our, okay, I just wanted to dial down on this a little bit. And listen, I know you're not an expert on New York. You know, it's been a while. Been a while. I'm, not gonna, yeah. I'm not gonna hold you to it. And if anybody else on this panel has more information, but I am very always curious about how other states and other um, who have similar issues perhaps handle it. So you're saying a robbery, let's just say robbery, uh, let's imagine the same scenario, you know, committed by a gang. There's no enhancement in New York because it was done by a gang. But there's a, what you're saying is that there's a wider sentencing window and that in the sentencing phase, the DAs can come in and say, this was done for the purposes of advancing a gang, so we should get a higher sentence. Is that how it works in New York? Is that what you're saying? You, you could, I mean, that could be part of the argument if it, you know, comparing your Estes robbery example, right? Someone shoplifting turns into a robbery to, you know, five, like what we use, like five people attacking one on the street and, and they're members of the gang, that would be something that would aggravate each a member of those five could be convicted of the same charge, but may receive a different sentence because of those different elements that increase the seriousness or the violence or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm a little struck that there is not even a gang, an extra gang punishment, it's just an enhanced possible sentence enhancement uh, in, in New York. Do we know of any other state that has specific gang enhancements? 
Um, many states have them. You know, California basically was the at the forefront and kind of exported them, and lots mm -hmm. of states uh, adopted them. You, you can go on the, there's a website, I can send the link to Tom, um, that will tell you every state and whether they have it and what the elements of it are. And I've been in conversation with uh, Professor Babe Howell at, um, I want to say CUNY, I forget. I, I'm not a New York person, so I, I don't know if the college is there. Um, and she says, <laughs> she says that they um, are increasingly, the prosecutors are increasingly charging um, gang crimes. I don't know. I can't remember if it was about enhancements specifically or what, but they're starting, they're starting to ramp up their prosecutions. Um, and so she would be a person to, to speak to. She's written a couple of articles, recent articles on it. Yeah, okay. Professor Howell, what she's been looking at is uh, a broadening use of conspiracy charges to bring in more and more people. So it's not so much about the sentencing, it's about the vicarious liability, I guess you might say, the, the, the accomplice conspiracy um, becoming wider and wider until it includes hundreds of people, um, many of which have never considered committed any crimes more serious than drug possession. I, I actually could speak to this for a second, Mike. I know we're almost out of time, but I was a public okay. defender in New York. And I remember having a case where the indictment was literally 150 pages long, double spaced, uh, big type, but still. Um, and the, the, the list of co-defendants was three to four pages of that. That was single space, very tight typeface. And I would, you know, make it OCR and look through the defendant that I had. He'd be mentioned one time in this whole indictment, but that was enough to get him in the conspiracy. And, you know, Sean, you know better than I do perhaps, but I think the gang culture on the East Coast is distinct from the West Coast one and doesn't present um, the same issues. I mean, you literally would have particular floors of housing projects that would be a, you know, a, a click or a crew as they were more often called there. And um, it, 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 it just wasn't as prevalent as, or prevalent as um, my experience has been out here um, that perhaps influences some of the prosecutorial culture. And I also have the sentencing chart I use, which, which fits on two pages. So we can look at that another time. Uh, you can see a way to make things a little bit easier here too. <laughs> Thank you. And without going too, too far down this road, and I, I, I started us down this, um, and we only have a, a little bit more time. Uh, Mr. Rooney, I was wondering if you could, uh, wondering if you had thoughts on ways that might be better ways to define what a, a gang is to maybe eliminate some of the disparities that we're so concerned about, if at all, um, or perhaps ways of enhancing or improving uh, 1385 to, I mean, right now, 1385, I mean, you know, it's just, you know, there's, there's no limits on it. There's no guidance. Um, and is that a possible way that we might uh, be able to help um, address some of the concerns that, that you've heard today? That's or maybe put question. it another way, maybe put it another way to implement some of the practices that you guys are already doing in San Joaquin County uh, statewide? I mean, I think one of the things is you want to just tell people, just follow the law, right? And one of the concerns that Sean had that he expressed in his written materials about, um, you know, using predicate offenses, for example, from people who have no relation to the defendant, right? Never met him, never heard of him, any kind of thing. You know, the, the Prunty decision got to some of that, right? Because I think prosecutor's offices were just getting lazy and they were just saying, you know, once, you know, this guy's a Norteño, that guy's a Norteño, he lives on the other side of town. He doesn't even know this guy exists type of thing. So, so in our, in our office, you know, if we're, if we're looking at, is this, is this a chargeable gang case or we, how, how many degrees of separation between the predicates we're going to use and who this guy is, right? Do we, do we have a connection between that? I don't know how you legislate that. Um, I mean, Sean and Lisa may have, you know, ideas on that. Um, I, in terms of the, the general uh, definition and, and, and improved um, amended definition, um, I have to keep racking my brain for that. I don't, I don't know because I think if you, and I don't even know how you would require like proof of more formal organization because as everybody here knows, 
we have, you know, like NS and, you know, Mexican mafia who are super organized, you know, hierarchical organizations. And then, you know, then you have your, your crew. It's a, it's a, it's a robbery crew that grew up on the same street. They fit the statutory definition and they have a name and they have sweatshirts and they have music videos. Um, and they're, and they're, they're in a shooting war across town, right? Those are both gangs, but they're very different in terms of all the dynamics within them. And then in terms of the formality of their structure. So I, I think that Sean would say NF, yes, group, you know, street group, no, um, right? <laughs> yeah, I see that. Um, but I don't know how you, how you legislate that. And I, I'm, I'm open to, you know, suggestions. Well, like, like I said to, to DA Rosen, we're going to sentence you to um, the enhancement of continuing to work with us <laughs> on figuring that out. Uh, Senator Skinner. Well, the only question I'd raise about that is I, I, I appreciate the distinction, but I would like to have some evidence that the folks that we have um, imprisoned for gangs are in a significant role in those really organized um, Mexican mafia type gangs that you've described. And my, while, while person X may be affiliated, they may really be in the type of level that it's no different than any other street level gang. And so then it raises to me, what have we really done by putting them in prison for, you know, decades when the, the, this other operation, which is clearly, I think almost, I mean, it's not impossible for a DA to deal with, but it's almost something that FBI level, uh, you know, it's the type of investigation that is, requires so much different resources and so much. So I, I just think that we need to, um, to also distinguish between that, because I doubt that we have that many pivotal figures in our state prisons, but I could be wrong. I, I think you're right, Senator, that um, there, we need to be able to tell, and, and sometimes our response is only going to be as good as our intelligence, right, and the information we have. And I think that's part of Sean's point, right, is that the, the cops are going off the information that they have. and and maybe that's, that information isn't good enough, which is also part of why I led with the wiretap stuff, because we need that to figure out who's who, right? So we don't end up with the 100 page indictment um, that's treating everybody the same. And, and we really want, you know, the three or four guys who are, you know, the shot callers or, you know, are sending people out on the street to do shootings where a wiretap is going to tell us that, right? And, and the reason why I know that we were talking about the B, you know, the enhancement, but I just wanted to kind of flag that because I think that was a surprise to people that if we just said, if you got enough momentum to say, take out 186.22, that you could literally go up on a wiretap on the drug dealer on the corner who's never held a gun or a knife in his life, but not on the gun running, robbing, burglarizing group down the street. So that's why I just wanted to flag that. Sorry, I was on mute for a second. Uh, S Assembly Member Kamlager, I'll give you the last question. We're out of time after this. No, I just wanted to agree with um, Senator Skinner. I mean, I've seen cases where a young person was stopped and after a series of questions, the first of which was, you know, are you in a gang or do you know someone who's in a gang? And they say, yes, my cousin. And then the, the rest of the conversation goes sideways because there are just all of these assumptions made. And it's, it's um, incredulous to assume that um, in many communities, someone wouldn't know someone in a gang, but that doesn't mean that that person is bad. It doesn't mean that they're doing anything illegal. It doesn't mean that that person is actually a gang member. But, you know, affiliations because of relations also shouldn't be how we're subscribing um, punishment. I mean, it's the same thing with, like, you know, the whole thing with can you be with someone who's on probation and they violate, but they're homeless and they end up at their grandmother's house and and the person who shouldn't be visiting them because they're on probation does because it's the grandmother and then it goes sideways. So I think we have to kind of focus more on what we're actually trying to accomplish with the codes rather than how to cast as wide a net as possible and leave it up to people to decide 
when they want it, you know, when they want to use that big net and when they don't. Can I just add a point to that? I, I think that the key might be looking at what makes a prosecutor want to use the gang enhancement. And I think, I think the answer from the defense perspective is that it allows the gang, a gang cop, a cop, <laughs> to come in and give all the testimony in a neat package and, and give up, you know, give this very pre, uh, prejudicial testimony. So maybe the answer is to cir circumscribe uh, what, the, what the officer can say and not let him opine on all of the elements to, to, bear, to, to really circumscribe his ability to testify. And then if the prosecutor really feels it's a gang case, it's going to be harder to prove, but, but it would be worth it. Um, but I think right now we've created the system where, you know, you, you just call the, the guy at the, the gang unit and he comes and he has his, you know, set testimony um, and he fills in the name of the defendants. And I think that is really pushing um, the ubiquitous use of, of the enhancements. Well, um, we're, I'm going to cut, cut us off here. Uh, I, I want to say a couple things. Um, even before uh, the events of this summer where, uh, you know, race and the justice system, you know, obviously became a national issue. One of the, you know, our guiding um, instructions from the governor was to address uh, racial disparities in California's system. And this area, uh, you know, sticks out like, like a sore thumb. I think at the same time, all of us on the committee uh, appreciate that there are um, serious organized um, gangs who um, endanger people's lives and make our communities less safe. And we want to try to do um, both at the same time, meaning keep our communities safe and reduce not only unnecessary and unfair incarceration, but especially uh, racially disproportionate um, punishment and prosecutions. Um, so um, I'm going to keep the joke going and saying that we're going to enhance you guys all to uh, please, please help us. Um, I think that we can find some consensus around, I mean, we in a very short time, the consensus around the misdemeanor gang enhancements. Again, this goes back to the data. I have no idea how big a problem that is. It seems like it can be, as it's an entry ramp to a lot of problems um, at the very least. Um, maybe that's a place to start, but hopefully we can find um, other areas as well. Thank you all for your time. We'll certainly uh, be in touch.